So hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of Fight Chat Friday with TKD Coach Academy. We are Adrian Byrne and Richie Ford and every Friday we're trying to bring you a little bit of the very best of ICF Taekwondo competition sparring, coaching or performance. So what have we got today Richie? So today we're going to go back a little bit and take a look like we did originally in the first couple of episodes of one particular match. So this match is just a little bit of a contrast from what we usually look at. It's to do with the Pan Ams. So this particular video comes from the Pan Ams in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and it features um, Nicholas Duchard from Jamaica and an Argentine, Argentinian fighter as well. So um, this video comes from Srinogo TV. So we'll have a look at it, take a few bits, and maybe we'll be able to talk through some contrast between the European scene and maybe and the South American scene and talk through a couple of points there. Cool. So uh, as Richie has said, we will definitely be looking at what's going on in Europe versus, you know, it's not entirely typical of South America, but we're certainly looking at some different styles that you wouldn't see as much of in Europe. We'll be looking at the use of the front leg for control of distance, tempo and pressure and various ways that you can do that throughout this match. And we'll look at the ways that the competitors line up the side kick and talk a little bit about the efficiency and effectiveness of their choices. We'll also spend a little bit of time looking at proactivity versus reactivity in the ring and how this impacts uh, how a match goes. So let's just jump straight into the match. So again, I suppose that the first thing that jumped to my mind uh, was kind of had to remind myself that the Pan Americans is not like the European Championships. It's a little bit different in that it, it's, it's a bit more like a European Cup or a World Cup uh, in that it's a club level championships uh, with top competitors from all of the Americas, but club level. Um, and you can see some of the like little subtle differences in the rules. So the ring size for a start is, you know, it's seven by seven to the outside of the blue there. So effectively, they're fighting at different rules from most of the matches that we'd have been watching so far. Yeah, and I think it's uh, important to note as well that this match starts off um, in a three-minute round, as far as I'm aware. So yeah. um, it's a bit different to the two-by-two two that we're usually accustomed to in Europe. So yeah, I think it, it comes with more of um, kind of like a, a cup feel rather than a championships feel. So that's one difference for sure, I think. Definitely. We can see very, very testy yeah, footwork sure. from Nick here, can't we? The, it's uh, And we get the contrast of right, right versus left-sided fighters for the most part. But I feel less sure of myself in saying that you have a right and left-sided fighter. There's a lot more change of leg than we'd be used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that um, it sets up different shots for different people as well. And we might see that um, in in this particular fight as well but Nick's doing a great job here of putting the pressure on with that front leg and that's something that's very very important especially look at the size of the ring that we've got here it's very very important to be able to be the one that pushes the, the pace in terms of pushing pushing the opponent backwards and trying to get that space to just be um, eliminated from any options that they can have yeah definitely it doesn't lend itself as well to being uh, you know a, an edge of the ring style of fighter you know pulling your opponent around you don't have uh any safety valve or a safety net there to uh get you out of trouble if you go backwards yeah nice little angle pull there by the argentinian but um i'd like to see just a little bit more of build up pressure to to use that ring a little bit more because as we said it really takes away the options of the person who's on the edge so yeah. it's just having that real substance on your on your sidekick and a real threat is, is something that's very valuable and the, and the reset here comes comes right back into the center of the ring. That's one of the problems with it being so small, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you can see where if if you have the a very nice step through from nice Nick there. Yeah. Um, if if you do have the dominance in terms of your control of distance using that front leg as well, like it should be that over the course of the match, it, it's you're you're going to build up uh, a lead on warnings as well. You know, there, there yeah. there's no two ways about it. But you should be if you're controlling the center and you're driving the other person at the edges. The number of scoring opportunities and the number of opportunities to develop warnings or uh, or exits, um, it should really build up as you go. Yeah, and I think that the fact that Nick is well ahead here, he's just almost waiting for the Argentinian opponent to just come through, and he's just cutting them off every single time with the front hand. Sometimes with the back hand, and it's, it's quite quite easy really once you have that distance and tempo control, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And 
you know i mean you're looking at that and we, we've picked it. it it's actually difficult enough to go on youtube and find an awful lot of quality footage from pan ams it doesn't uh, get as well reported as we'd be used to i suppose from some of the um the european championships or even some of the the major uh like the finals of the world championships and world cup obviously you'll get a lot more video footage um but nick is a guy that we've seen at many european or sorry many world championships many world cups and you know he's a, a you know a very flashy and showy competitor from uh, jamaica and uh you know it's nice to kind of have a look and see somebody who fights so differently to the majority of what we're used to in europe and i think one of the things that can happen because uh in the european countries we compete against each other so often is there's not an awful lot of new stuff tried you know in it's all small iterative change it's it's small things that are changed over and over and over again and everyone has a fairly good uh not necessarily an understanding but a um like a they have the same ideas about what's efficient what's effective what works and what doesn't and then when you jump out of that pool and you have a look at what's working in uh in south america or in pan ams here you know what's working for a jamaican sparring an argentinian and it can be quite different and there's shots that turn up in in this match that you're just like i, I don't know a european competitor who tried that or who throw that unless the match was already you know completely decided yeah i think that's a good point because a lot of time the the game state is something that's very very um it's, it's like very in the forefront of people's minds in the european scene mm. it's like get the win and do your job rather than do it in a flashy manner um, but we can see here that that some of these guys come with a little bit more flair and it's nice to see as well. It shows you see some spinning techniques there. Um, and we see like at one stage, um, Nick kind of like spins into um, his opponent and he just doesn't have the space to get it off. Yeah. But then he, luckily he, he's he probably well ahead in that match. So he, he can afford to take these almost risks. But yeah, it is something that um, like I think that in the European scene that it's it's a little bit more in terms of get your job done and focus mm. on winning the match, even if it has to be ugly. Whereas um, something that I've noticed from the, the people on the on the other side of the Atlantic, it's a, it's a bit more uh, flashy at times and it can be a bit more, they have a bit more flair to their style, which is, which is cool to see. Yeah, willing to take a few more chances and try a few different things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, really right from the beginning, we're looking at something that's, I suppose very much more what we'd be used to in terms of the entry you know the getting the side kick getting your leg over the top dominating the range and you know uh and a mistake from the argentinian with the with the step in there but that kind of entry would be very 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 standard from european side of things but it would be almost unheard of for someone to be changing their legs or throwing from the position that he's in after going to blinds out here changing into that that back leg in the midst of the punches and that that's just unusual different yeah i think sh straight off the bat that the step from the argentinian who is in the red helmet the fact that he steps it just gives yeah. nicholas an easy opportunity to lift and go above and that's a it's been a prominent feature in all of our fight chat friday series so far of being on top when it, both people are side kicking and then uh, it's just it's nice to see that 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 gameness of um, fighters as well. He's eager to get in there and get the points. You know, he's he's not really worried about the flash air. It's like get in and get your points. Be be dominant. Be aggressive, and that's cool to see as well. Um, and like that gives him the opportunity to change the levels then as well. So he he comes with that psychic originally, and he changes the level to the head section, eye section immediately, and, and that just continues to give people problems and things to think about. So that's nice that he just changed that level. It's a mm -hmm. nice little variation there as well and just getting stuck in there with that back leg finding finding the target at all costs and i like that yeah i think the step through that he has to hands as such are, it's kind of an unusual one where you know you wouldn't be expecting to see that it's an unusual kind of step through with the backhand that then leads to the turning kick but as you said it's it's the initial stages of the match it's a little bit scrappy the nerves are probably a little higher at the earlier stages as well and it does yeah. kind of smooth itself out as the match goes on um and I think actually, based on that point, Adrian, that like the fact at the start of the match, it, the person who can almost take the match to the other person has a yeah. big advantage because there's a, a bit of a feeling out process there. And the person who takes that initiative, I think that they generally have a, a good advantage on their side. 
yeah, it's that bit of acting and being proactive. And I think, you know, the uh, the old phrases like fortune favors the brave and all that kind of thing. It's, uh, mm. uh, you know, but, but it has a very practical and real effect in ITF sparring where when you're the person who decides to take the action, the other person automatically has to react to you and they're working with that reaction time. So they're behind, they're behind the curve right away from the beginning. So with that, it's usually better to set that tempo and act. And, you know, and that's just, uh, you know, that that's where Nick has started with this one. So, well, I'll be first. You know, he's gone very yeah. proactively into the match. Speaking of tempo, we have, um, you know, quite a bit of it. Yeah, and I think that, like, based on that point as well, the Argentinian fighter here is almost kind of like... Um, like it's not really a standard style we see and not a standard approach and it's very very important that you actually are proactive against people who are a little bit kind of unusual in their style because it can be very hard to counter people like this because the tempo is a little off their their shot selection is a little bit different to what you're used to and what you're training with so Mm -hmm. it it is important to be proactive in, in that term as well because you can't kind of react to something that you're not used to seeing like we've seen front kicks here and things that you generally wouldn't see at the highest level so yeah. I think it, it's very, very important to put your tempo on them and not be too reactive because if you do, you can be caught out and like you, you can be caught out with like a front kick or something that you really wouldn't expect to see because it's not something you'd expect at the highest level. But that is one of the threats that you have with somebody who's um, is, is just a little bit un, unusual in their style and not, not, the standards, um, not the standard approach that we would see at the high level, particularly in, in Europe. And, and one of the things we do see here is like they're starting with their the opposite leg in front to what they started the whole match with. So yeah. both fighters have, have changed. And, you know, it, it would be a very rare situation that you'd see both fighters voluntarily change their leg and, and you know, go to the opposite side. Um, so, you know, it is showing that um, from Nicholas' point of view, like, yeah, he's got the full range of shots on both legs, which is serving him here. Um, and he is able to make things maybe a little bit, bit more difficult and he's forcing those changes maybe a little bit on the Argentinian and leaving him uncomfortable. But I think the, the main point, as you said, is if you're not really sure how to deal with someone because what you're seeing in front of you isn't what you're used to seeing, the first step is, well, let's make them follow my plan rather than let yeah. me develop a plan around them. It's just execute. Yeah, I always found that when I was sparring anybody who's kind of unusual or didn't have that that normal style, it's 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 very very hard to counter them, and it takes a, a little bit of time to get into their rhythm and into their flow. So I think the best bet in, in these short rounds that we have is, is to put your game on them. Mm. I think that, that that's the best way to go about somebody who is maybe like not the standardized style that you'd see. So I mean, we certainly meet those people. You don't have to travel to South America or Pan Ams to meet people True. that have an orthodox style. You'll certainly find it in every local tournament you go to. Um, and like the the old adage for instructors was, the most dangerous thing you can do is spar a yellow belt because you've no idea what they're going to do. Exactly. And you know, and it is true as well. But the it, it begs the question then is, as if you're a you know classically a counter fighter or a reactive fighter what do you do when the other person doesn't act to give you the space for your reaction? And mm. you have that it does kind of suggest that you need that other game that you can go to. Definitely. And and that's something that like for me, it just really suited my style to be a counter fighter. It's like it was kinda like naturally my personality kind of like easy going, kinda like, you know, not really like the aggressive type to be pushing forward. And I think that people are like that. So but you, you really do need to not be dependent on that style because things like smaller rings that we see here and things mm-hmm. like that bigger opponents if you rely completely on counter-attacking and everything is not as it seems here then um it, it can be very very difficult so you need to be able to have really good maybe setups and um lower them in a bit of push and pull with your footwork things like that set traps for them to come into as well as having that in your back pocket to, to be assertive and be aggressive with your own front leg and, and take the game to them. It's something that is is um is very important. You need you need that balance for sure. I think in the in the modern ITF game as well, you can't just rely on one style completely. You really do need that balance. Yeah, I think you've queued up the next clip very, very well there as well, where we can kind of see uh Nick applying some of the or sorry, uh yeah, Nick applying some of those principles there where he's kind of setting a tempo and uh uh, using the front leg a little bit to um, to almost set that rhythm. Um, second, one, two, three. I think we have uh, 
yeah it's a, a different one let me let me grab that clip it's not going to be hiding far away um yeah but even on that clip there we see that um both fighters are very bouncy and i think that brings mm. that that energy and like that flair we talk about something interesting i think as well on the the sidekick side for um for for nick here is that it almost kind of like has a step approach so yeah. it's like one and two as it goes up so that's something that we kind of it generally um what you'd see kind of in europe is somebody will pick and that's their sure. range that they carry with yeah and um, so I, I i think it's a, just a nice little variation of it of just a, a step approach to it as well now he doesn't use it all the time so it's good to have that um just to have a, a bit of variance in your in your front leg as well just to keep people guessing you know yeah because I, if you have that step continuously you can uh it can be become a little bit predictable and maybe easy to counter if they can time the first lift because it's not so high you know yeah, I think that slightly disguised step, uh, you know, a very slight shortening of the stance to help you get that knee lift is sometimes, you know, a, a very, very useful trick to have. Um, going back to this one, then we have, uh, as I said, this is, this is where we're looking at, you know, kind of setting a rhythm and a tempo and then setting that trap that you were talking about. Um, so, you know, Nick has pushed and pushed and pushed with this sidekick and he's like, he's created the pressure, he's created rings, ring pressure because, you know, the Argentinian opponent is back now towards the edge of the ring. He's kind of forced to act. He wants to come back towards the center. Even that little step from Nick is kind of inviting him. No, you want to come back to the center. And then it gives him the Just opportunity to step through. So even if the, the general actions that the other person is taking are less predictable, human nature still takes effect, which is we want to fill an empty space we want to move away from the danger zone as such. And so you can use that to set up something like a direct counter with the, the punch there. Yeah, but you see even with the this change of stance here from the Argentinian in the red helmet, as he's just pushed to the edge, it's like almost like he's setting up for like a, like a back kick or something. So he mm -hmm. switches the stance because he like his his options are really, really limited here. So he's probably setting up a back kick, but then Nick gives that space back to him. So he's like, okay, I'll come in. And it's probably on his non-preferred leg then as well. So it just makes it a little bit easier to cut through and take that nice, clear front hand. Yeah. And I mean, even though it looks like Nick isn't acting here, he's already made his decision. You know, yeah. it's, you know, he's he's decided, yeah, I'm going to go to that front hand. I'm going to throw in there and I'm going to leverage the opportunity that I'm giving to the other person. I mean, that on a, a micro level there is something that we've talked about quite a bit before, which is that if you can create mental pressure, for somebody if you can make them uncomfortable and then give them what they want to solve the problem that, that you'll usually take it so like the situation of being you know a couple of points ahead with a very short space of time left and the other person needs a headshot well if you offer them a headshot they'll probably go for it even if it's mm -hmm. not the best shot in the world or even if it's like exactly what you want for your counter um it, it's just it's, it's our nature we know we have a coach behind us who's telling us we need three points to go 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 and the person is just showing us three points we'll probably like we won't be able to resist it we'll try and take it and when that happens if the person who's offering it, it it's a feint and they have a, a counter ready it gives you a chance to get one of those really nice counters where everything is lined up correctly you have you've predicted the shot you're waiting for your cue to go the leg comes up and bang you know and you get that yeah. nice reverse or you get that nice whatever and, and that's think, something that all the, the top guys have, isn't it? They, they they give you something and you say, oh, that's nice, I'll take that. And then it's actually just a trap to set you up into something else. So, yeah, yeah any of the top, top fighters are... are um, and it's probably... It's not even something that they're consciously thinking of, that it's just... A, it's almost kind of like subconscious of they're just setting you up and they just lure you into something. Um, so it's kind of... Yeah, it's it's funny how that works in terms of not always like predetermined, mm. but they can still uh, set up traps without even being conscious about it. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing we'd often use the phrase of, you know, leave the door open, you know, if you want someone to go somewhere or if you're inviting a sidekick, you want to counter, well, you show them where the sidekick goes, you know, you move the arm out of the way to show them the, the path. And the reason you do that is you don't want the sidekick to the face. So you show them where the sidekick should go. Yeah, and yeah. We're, as you said, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the constraint sparring, we talked about like action, reaction, coupling, you know, they're perceiving a gap. And it's probably subconscious it's chunked it's already bundled information and the body's just going oh yeah i kick into that gap and yeah yeah they're having to fight against their nature 
sometimes. Now you could leave it super obvious, but these things work best when it's at a very high level and it's and uh, like it's a slight opening. It's it doesn't look like it's completely on purpose. Um, you know where where your feint before you blitz looks like the kick should look or looks like the you know, and what you often find at the earlier stages of sparring development is you know people make big pronounced movements that look nothing like what they're trying to feint and it, yeah, yeah. it doesn't work you're not really it selling it well are you you haven't sold it yeah you didn't uh, you, you didn't sell the picture there and then and that's what goes wrong and then you know as you get much better at it your whole body moves in the same way as if you were going to throw the side kick but maybe the leg doesn't come the whole way off the ground you get your foot down and then you're going into whatever it was you were going to throw for real um mm. And I think we've actually skill. seen that a few times in, in this fight as well, where the Argentinian like, w- was trying to create space to relieve the pressure for himself, but mm-hmm. he just didn't have that substance and that real threat to sell his own front leg. Yeah. So it wasn't really something that like forced Nick to, to take a back step or to, to really react to, you know? So I think that that's, a, that's something that's very, very important and a good takeaway from this is that you need to have substance behind that front leg to, to relieve pressure at times. It's, it's a very valuable think to have in your back pocket definitely and one of the things we can look at in this match as well was there was an example of where the argentinian actually used that front leg and the pressure situation against nicholas so we might just have a quick look at this one um and there's a I, i've bundled in another little clip into this as well with the um just the refereeing at the start where you know there, there's some very unusual positioning and warnings going on and yeah we'll come right back, back to, that, to the center almost like wacko or something mm. But we see the Argentinian trying to take a little space and then... Then relieves it again. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. But it was that element of, and we hadn't seen it much from either of the guys, where, you know, invading the space and, you know, as you move back from the the sidekick, just giving it that little bit of space so you have the room to get the the push-pull counter in, you know. So there has been a push from the Argentinian here. So we, we, it's gone over and back a little bit. So Nick has kind of uh, moved back first off the Argentinian. He goes in himself. Um, and then there's this like pull, pull, and he's inviting the shot in. And in the end, Nick goes high. That was actually good high. from the Argentinian there. Really, yeah. really nice, yeah. But Nick goes high. He, he's, been, he's been going middle with the sidekick, middle with the sidekick, and then he goes high. So he's dropping heavier, and the Argentinian uses that to bring the backhand in. I think, you know, it's a tried something similar there on the edge of the ring but he didn't have the space to put it off he needed more distance but that idea of you know if you can invite invite and the uh, the shot goes long you know nick had the opportunity there to do it himself but he shifts up here goes high and lands heavy and uh, you have a reversal of ring position now again in both of these instances i think the, the warning is odd and the repositioning yeah. or the reset after it is odd and like that, that that's that's a warning in itself he's after putting his foot outside the ring and lifting his front foot yeah so there's a warning straight away and nick gets the warning which is odd then it's reset to the center which is not that's ideal so again odd. yeah and then it's the same on, on the end of this clip here where he's putting the pressure on i know he probably gets his back turned but i think it's in motion of the kick so but then the reset like it's just left yeah. to come back to wherever they like so yeah it's not ideal in terms of um when you are when you are conscious of that space and when you are trying to put your opponent in particular areas of the ring it's probably not ideal and not what you want but neither guy seems to complain they're happy to just fight it on no i mean there's a lot of continuity to the match and there's something to be said for that you know when you're a competitor you enjoy to have that continuity but tactically it changes things because in europe that would be a coach jumping and what what's going on you know there, there would definitely be a case of because those we'd look at it that that one third of a point or that that thing could be the thing that decides the match at the end and it often is you know the Mm. matches would tend to you know at a high level be very very close the difference of a warning given or incorrectly given or an exit not being called or a reposition not being given appropriately is enough for people to go well hang on a second here this isn't being done right because that's often the difference between winning and losing a match um you know you might have been working for 15 seconds to position the person towards the edge of the ring and now they've conceded the warning and you want them to stay there because you've only got a warning out of it you haven't been able to build your score yet and then if the referee just says yeah you can go behind me there and we'll uh we'll start in the opposite facing and everything it's like oh but maybe it doesn't matter as much in a seven by seven true yeah but you know. it also goes back to what we were saying earlier of maybe the European guys are really focused on getting that win, even if it's ugly. 
Yeah. Whereas these guys are kind of just, they're kind of just enjoying the techniques and they're just flowing from shot to shot and enjoying the back and forth and the, and the, the combat side of it. They're not really focused too much on the, on the game state. And maybe it's because like Nick is probably well ahead and it's not really, um, yeah. it's not really a close match really in terms of scores, I would imagine. So maybe that factors into it as well. But yeah, definitely. I think that that might be something in play here of, of the, the game state is definitely something that is of much more importance for the for the guys of what I've seen, at least in the high level and senior level than um, in the European scene. But I think it also plays a bigger factor in the training and preparation for it. So there's an awful lot of time put into understanding, you know, the small little variations in the game state and the actions, because, you know, you can see neither guy is actually expecting anything else to happen. There's not, it's not like if, if someone traveled in Europe, you, if my opponent travels, I'm going to stand exactly where I was and I'm going to almost point to the floor of like, yeah, that's where he needs to go. You know, mm -hmm. it'll almost be like... you see that so often, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. Like, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm giving him his meter, but he's got to go there. Yeah. And that's it. And and you'll see that. And if I was getting given a warning, there'd be almost like a, whoa, 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 hang on a second. He traveled, not me. And I think on that level, you know, what we're used to seeing in Europe is people who are hyper aware of the game state and the warning situation and... The, the micro advantages that are to be gained and maybe it's because our euros happen on an eight by eight with a one meter safety and yeah. there's that much more space so taking the person's space was a bigger effort in the first place and then locking them down into that space that you've kind of constricted them to so you can build a score becomes a bigger thing because neither person really has to get scored against if you both have the full ring to play in like you need to yeah, actually do like the prep work it also depends on how you train because like if you're just training and everybody is is just using the the space you have available and bumping off each other and resetting you score a great shot and then you kind of just switch off touch gloves and reset as opposed to if you're training in a designated space just the two of you in this space and you're controlling more on the positioning and the space of the ring i do think it makes a big big difference and i know that like when we go to um squad training with the irish national team and stuff it like there is a lot of rings being used and it's yeah. not whereas everybody's just thrown onto the floor and you bumping off each other and you touch gloves reset after a good shot and things like that it it, it the, the, that um part of the training i think is something that's often overlooked that because like sometimes the, the space isn't there or you don't have the resources that you in the places you're training that that can kind of filter into your um, sparring mentality then as well. And it's something that you might not be hyper aware of as opposed to um, like we've seen in, in the more European side of things, as we just mentioned. Even the simple thing of like, you, you know, you start traveling backwards and if you're used to training in a smaller space, you start looking over your shoulder for the wall, you know, and yeah, you know, it's little things like that, but these trained habits become part of the, your, you know, your actual play and, uh, and they can be problematic. So, you know, there are things like that that you definitely want to, wherever you can, you want to learn your ring craft in a ring. There's a reason why boxers practice in a boxing ring, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a totally different game if you have a five by five space with, or a six by six space, depending on the codes, but with, with the ropes up. And um, if you don't have those ropes to work around, if you don't feel what it's like to be pushed there, or even the difference of the canvas under the foot. And we find that like, you know, the difference of a mat, you know, you only have to go back to the world championships in Canada and was it 2007 seven um, and like the mats were a bit slippy and mm -hmm. it especially that center itf crest if you stood on yeah. that as like an ice rink you're gone yeah and so it changed how you know how people fought and as i said okay well everyone had to adapt equally sure if you were all starting from the same point but if everybody had a different style and different pre like preparation it's not equal it will benefit someone more than another away you go and that's the kind of thing there so like if everybody knows going into Pan Ams, it's on a seven by seven, fine. Uh, if you get a bit surprised by it and you, you you land down there and you go, ooh, where's my eight by eight? You know, gone. It's it's going to be a different story altogether. So yeah, I think yeah, it's it's a really interesting contrast for me between some of the fights that we've looked at from Euros, Worlds, World Cup, where everything on that front has been standard. You know, standard rules, two by two minute rounds, um, you know, the eight meter ring with the safety and all the rest of it. And then we're looking at a match that effectively is using a slightly different rule set. Um, it is a lot more like watching a hybrid of the ITF and the wacko like contact, you know, from that yeah. point of view. 
it's just well I suppose one good thing about it is as you said earlier there's a bit of a more flow to the match I suppose yeah um, but then that that does take away the the idea of like using space to your advantage and things like that so yeah there's there's pluses and minuses to it all isn't there that's it so maybe we'll leave that match there because we have a question in from Instagram and uh, this one uh, what are some setups I can use to land my turning kick to the head and I quite like this nice easy uh, a nice easy question but not necessarily easy to answer all the time um, yeah, because it, it, it really depends really we don't know there. the individual in question but um, do you want to start with one or two ideas yeah so let's break it up first into we say like attacking and defending so for mm. me like you can like we've seen with Nick here it, the whole idea of changing levels is quite important so you need to have that dexterity and the flexibility to be able to do that and um, so by threatening one you open up the other and vice versa so first off that that's a very very important one if you want to set off and um, sorry set up the headshot off the turning kick and um, then on the defensive you can do a little bit of pulling around and stuff as well there's a shot that i used to like to use when we were kind of if the basically i was left leg lead a lot when i sparred but mm-hmm. if i was against somebody right leg lead and they kind of over committed on a side kick you could just like drift your hip back and bring up the leg over to the blind side yeah and um, we just call it like this the sneaky blinder so you just kind of like drift back and, and and just like catch them by surprise so a lot of time it can be just manipulation of things like that that makes a massive difference where just people are just unaware of the like a simple turning kick coming up on the blind side and um, so they're just two that you can play with straight off of changing levels when you're attacking and keep your opponent guessing and then on the defensive maybe just playing to the just the looking for over extensions and maybe like we talked about today selling that then as well of, of giving that to them maybe thinking that the shot is there and they over they yeah. over reach and over extend and that just can almost set you up by um coming up over the blind side so yeah there, there's a couple of ideas there for sure yeah there's a few fighters that do very well now i mean my initial imp- impression when i read the question and uh was you know you could think turn and kick like there there's there's things that are like it's going to be a short kick for a start most of the time if it's a big round shot off your back leg there's a lot more prep that's going to be required for the person yeah. to walk themselves into that because you can't just throw that and have that work so if it's going to be a shorter sharper shot um and potentially off the front leg then we have a couple of options so you could look at someone like um any of the uh any of the top irish 63s from the past i don't know how many years someone like julio carlos um you know there, there's a lot of guys that have a uh a, a colin adolf so another great example who've got a lovely front leg blindside shot so it's, it's like that defensive shot the sneaky blinder you're talking about but it'll generally be led into a two or three side kicks or knee lifts or presses and in a kind of a universal chamber position where they you know it could be a side kick hook kick turning kick and then the knee comes up just as it did before for the side kick to the hip and then the foot just floats over the blind side shoulder and you know there's damage done by competitors every single tournament with that particular shot because it's so hard yeah. to defend because if you bring your front hand up, if you try to do something with your front hand to defend it, you're risking that it's just a, another side kick to the to the ribs or to the hip. And if you try to step through that side kick, you know, expecting that it's going to float up and it doesn't float up, you're you're like in one of those like super exposed positions. Your hands out there, your ribs are fully stretched, and all of the judges see that score. So if you've got a very good control of your body position, your chamber, so that it always looks the same, whether you're going to the hip, the ribs, the head, and you can change from side kick to hook kick to turning kick, that front leg shot is an absolute beast. It's one that, you know, if you can have it in your arsenal, you want it to be there. And as you've said, you, mm-hmm. you made really good use of it on the defensive. So I think it's not the, the, the classical big leg swing from the back leg that you might want to score because it feels good when that thing lands. Um, yeah but but everybody's gonna see it coming but everyone sees it coming and the only kind of opportunities i see like you can take the back leg through like that is where you've already forced your opponent to move so your initial movement you know maybe you've pressured them towards a corner but you've left the door open for them to move out to your open side and they walk themselves onto it you actually see that shot often wouldn't you but they have to almost walk themselves onto it and it's really 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 difficult to just throw a big leg from the back 
and have that yeah. land. The one other time that you see it is if you're one of those people who, you know, if you get through to hands and you get the momentum for a continuation, then the back leg can fly. You know, it, yeah. as long as the person's moving away from you, you can do it. We've seen that actually on a, a fight we did with uh, David Emesino, where he he did a great job of that, of, of using his hands to, to almost blindly set up that back leg turning kick straight yeah. to the head. That's a great score. It's nice and clear for the judges and, and, and great to see. And it's very hard to see it coming as well because you're, you're almost preoccupied with the hands. Yes. And getting in on that hand exchange and try to fight back and be busy on the inside. And all of a sudden, there's a leg coming up as well. So, yeah, I would, I would suggest check out Davide on that. He, he's quite good on that one. Yeah, and he does, like his body positioning to get the back leg in, he takes his head and his body out of the way of the line of attack to, to get that shot there. And if you really yeah. want to look at people landing front leg turning kicks to the head, you got to check out Zach Espy because, you know, it's uh, he's one of those guys that just okay. He's, we don't see him competing now, but you know the, he put front leg turning kicks to the head. You know, mm. every match you're going to see it happen. Just just doesn't matter which match you pick. Just wait, it'll be there. So, um, that would be one to watch for sure as well. So, Brilliant. as a few takeaways from this one, then yeah. So, <clears throat> what makes a good front leg attack? So we had a chat about that. We were talking about. It needs to be something that really gives a good threat mm. and it needs to be something that has a bit of substance behind it, you know. So um, like we've seen with Nick here, he, 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 any time that he did do it well, he was pushing his opponent back and really making them uh, react to it. And of course, if you can do that while taking space away and limiting your opponent's abilities to move and avoid, then even better again. So um, we talked about like the importance of having it as well if you're predominantly a counter fighter that it's a very, very important tool to have to relieve pressure as well. Yeah, definitely. And the second takeaway I think that we had then was just in terms of acting rather than reacting. So you want to be in a position where you're the one dictating the pace of the match and you're the one taking the first action. Um, we've talked a little bit about good counter-attacking and good counter-attacking style, etc. But you will always have uh, the advantage if you're the one who is initiated. So whether you're an attacker and you've set the rhythm and you've uh, set the attack or you're a defender and you've opened the invitation or you'd, you've offered the opportunity to attack by kind of predetermining what the attack will be, you're the actor in that situation and the other person mm -hmm. is reacting. And that's definitely over and over and over again, you'll see that that is uh, or carries advantages with it. So all the time, I suppose, you won't be thinking about it, but when you're training, you should be thinking in terms of what am I doing now? What what am I just bouncing? Am I waiting? Am I watching? Or am I actually trying to improve the game state? And you should always be proactively trying to improve the game state. Yeah, and I think two important points on that is of why you need to do it is number one, it's not like WT where we have the body armor and any kick that makes contact is scored electronically. It's more of we've got four referees who visually see this. So mm -hmm. anybody with a, a good bit of forward momentum will generally catch the eye of the referee with a shot. So that's something that's, that favors the proactive side. And then as well as, as that, we, we have like a quite limited amount of time to get our scores on the board in ITF. Generally, we're talking two, two rounds of two minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's not a lot of time, four minutes. So anybody who can who can get their scores on the board, it's, n it's generally not a very high scoring sport, especially at the, the top level. So the people who can be proactive and, and get their job done, uh, they, they, of course, they're going to have an advantage. Sure. So I think that does for this week. Very good. Yeah. So if you've enjoyed it, make sure and give the video a like. And um, always send in your recommendations and your suggestions for future episodes. So mm -hmm. drop them in the comment box below and we'll definitely take a look at them and any good ideas. We'll um, hopefully be able to put that together in a future episode. And of course, if you are interested in the more mental side of training and competition, be sure to check out our Mindset Monday series, which is just after being released from last week. So that will be released every Monday. So if that's something that interests you, make sure and get involved there as well. Perfect. We'll see you next week. See you then.